Hello there and welcome to Crypt Talk. This is a new show which you'll see on Biz News twice a month. I'm Ross Sinclair and I have with me Gaurav Nair of Geltech. Thank you for being here, Gaurav. Sure, my pleasure, Ross. Uh, let's just start off with the basics. What is um, Geltech and what do you do? Sure, so I'm one of the founders of Geltech and it's an alternative investment management firm. Now, alternatives are the type of investments that are not in the listed space, like listed shares and listed bonds, mm -hmm. which have really been the bedrock of most, uh, most investors' portfolios. Um, more and more investors want exposure to alternatives as the traditional investments have, have not performed so well or been, so, been too expensive. Interest rates have been low, et cetera. Um, and one of the products that we offer are cryptocurrency products or cryptocurrency basket. Okay, so what is a cryptocurrency basket? Sure, so maybe we should start with uh, cryptocurrencies and, and blockchains. Yeah, let's go into the basics. Um, yeah, what is a, a blockchain? What is a blockchain? Sure. So a blockchain is a system for verifying transactions. That's what it is at the most basic level. Um, and an analogy that we often use is if you imagine a postal service and you imagine it has branches all around the country. And um, if I come to the Johannesburg branch and I want to post a package, um, what happens is at the time that I go to the, the Johannesburg branch, it sends a message to all the branches all around the country saying, Gaurav left a package here destined for Ross in Cape Town. Um, and then the, when the delivery man comes and takes the, the package, um, that's verified again by all the branches. So in this way, the Johannesburg branch can't do anything funny. It can't take the package for itself. It can't send it to someone else, etc. And in that way, it ensures that the package arrives safely in Cape Town in your hands. Um, blockchains work in the same way. Uh, there are a bunch of computers. They are all verifying transactions. Uh, there's no need for each of them to trust each other. If anyone cheats, the other computers catch that. Um, and so it's a very sophisticated way to verify transactions. Okay, I see. So it works well for verifying like currency and if you move things around. And then, so is each coin built onto a specific blockchain? That's right. So there are numerous chains out there. The most well-known chain is the Bitcoin chain on which the Bitcoin token is transferred. And the Bitcoin chain was made almost solely just for transferring the Bitcoin token. There are other chains out there. There's the Ethereum chain, which is the next biggest chain. Um, the Ethereum chain is, is uh, different from the Bitcoin chain in that there are thousands of tokens on there. There's the native token, which is called Ether, but there are a whole bunch of other tokens that have been listed and put on there as well. And so the Ethereum chain, it actually validates the transfer of all these other tokens as well, not just the, the, the Ether token. Okay, can these, these blockchains interact with each other? Um, so they can't interact with each other in their current state. Okay. Um, what happens is third parties out there, they have tried to build systems that allow these to interact with each other. They're called bridges or a, a, another blockchain that interacts with the individual blockchains that are out there. Um, but typically, these blockchains themselves, they are a, their own ecosystem, and they don't, they don't play with each other except for through these bridges, etc. Okay, I see. So it's been rapidly adopted over the past few years, um, cryptocurrencies. What is it going to look like in the future with practical applications? Well, um, because it's at its core a system for validating transactions, um, the default use case is going to probably be for financial transactions. Uh, Bitcoin was seen as a payment method. Um, you could buy Bitcoin where you are, send it to someone in a different country via the internet, and they would receive it almost instantaneously as compared to Swift, which sometimes takes days and is very expensive. Um, and on the Ethereum blockchain, people have started building projects that live on the blockchain. That's just code. And these projects are set to replace stock exchanges, set to replace banks, etc. So what's likely is that the first applications that we're going to see, we're already seeing them in fact, are to 
enhance or replace the financial system. However, there are a bunch of other applications out there. Um, a lot of people have, have heard of NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Uh, this is art that's on the blockchain. NFTs are much more than that. <laughs> um, so what we're going to see is a lot of applications, but it's a bit like the internet in the 90s. This is a new technology. And if I told you in the 90s about this thing called a social network, it didn't even exist. There was not, there's not a non-internet version of that that it could replace. Um, so not only will we see the blockchains replacing things that are non-blockchain, but we'll see new applications that could not have been built without the blockchain. Um, and those are only in our imagination right now. It's been quite an unregulated market, which is why people have been skeptical for a while, but regulations are beginning to be introduced. Can you speak more to that? Is it going to be more of a, is it going to be beneficial to crypto or is it going to be a bit of a hindrance? Sure. Um, a lot of the people that first came into crypto, they quite liked that it was unregulated. They could do what they wanted to do. Um, and in 2017, you saw a lot of people cr selling tokens that were considered securities. Um, and so people enjoyed that it wasn't regulated because they could do all these things without being hampered and going through the process of regulations, etc. cetera. Um, however, the great majority of people that want to get involved in blockchain or are involved in cryptocurrencies, they're waiting for regulations. And that's because regulations provide protections. They stop people from committing frauds and cons. They provide protections of how much capital you should hold, etc. cetera. Um, and when regulations come in, far from hampering the space, a lot of people expect, because you won't be able to just do what you want to do. What we'll likely see is we'll likely see a lot of the big investors, the institutions, the pension funds, etc. Some of a lot of the banks, most of the banks don't have any exposure to blockchain. A lot of the banks and so on, these regulated institutions, they can't play here. And they're waiting for regulations before they can. And in all these companies, there are fund managers and so on who believe in blockchain, but they just can't do it. Their hands are tied. Um, so what's likely to happen if the regulations are made sensically, there's always the chance the regulators put in bad regulations that hamper the space. But if they're made sensically, you will likely see all these investors that have been waiting on the sidelines starting to come in. And this inflow of money will hopefully encourage more innovation, more people want to work in the space, et cetera. Um, we've seen that in the US, there's been a draft bill that was just last week circulated, or earlier this week, in fact, and it looks, it looks quite sensical. There's a couple of things in there which maybe need to be changed. It is a draft bill, but it looks like a really good approach to, to uh, regulating crypto in the US. And as the US goes, so a lot of the world follows. And in South Africa too, our regulators have been saying to us that they're going to regulate the space. They've been issuing statements about what they think that could look like. And they're consulting with the industry. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, they're holding a session to consult with the industry. Um, and so we hope that we'll have something that provides investor protections, but also doesn't hamper the space and the innovation and the growth, et cetera. Fantastic. Now, obviously, there's been controversy, controversy recently with uh, the Lunaterra stablecoin, the USD, which was depegged. Um, how much damage has that done to trust in cryptocurrencies? So maybe to start, a stablecoin is a cryptocurrency that um, tries to maintain a stable price, it try, usually against the dollar, tries to stay one to one of the dollar. Other cryptocurrencies are so volatile, they can lose 50% of value in a day. Uh, however, with stable coins, it then allows you to pay someone. You don't want to pay half or double as much while the money is going there. Um, yeah. So, And so the, the Luna stable coin was a specific category of stable coin called an al algorithmic one. And um, and it didn't manage to stay one to one with the dollar. It broke its peg and eventually went basically to zero. Um, and with this event happening, a lot of value was lost. $50 billion was lost. Um, a lot of investors lost their life savings. They really believed in it. Um, and it's quite a tragic thing. However, we are in the very early days of blockchain. And I'm sure that when shares were invented three, 400 years ago, there were some massive catastrophes. We don't even need to look that far back. We can look at Enron in 2001. Mm. Um, but however, there is a bit of discovery and trying to figure out what's possible and what's not with this technology. Uh, but seeing this happen, a lot of the regulators around the world have said, we can't allow this to happen again. We need to regulate stable coins. Fortunately, there are a bunch of other stable coins out there uh, that work in different ways and have much more uh, sound, a sound basis of working. Um, how far did it set the cryptocurrency industry back? 
most of the people in Lunar Terra were people that are actually quite deeply into crypto. If you talk to people who the general public, often they didn't hear about it at all. Um, I think it did set it back, but I'm glad it happened at this early stage before blockchain has taken over the entire financial system and Lunar Terra was worth in the trillions of dollars. I'm glad it happened now and we can learn and improve and uh, hopefully have a better system for the future. The market sort of simultaneously while that happened, the markets crashed quite significantly. I mean, Bitcoin was trading um, at over a million rand at the end of last year. It's now 470,000. Uh, Ethereum was at 70,000. It's now 27,000. Um, do you think these prices are attainable once again? Or do you think it could even go higher than that? Well, I think though, an important thing to note, while the Terra Luna also contributed to the crash, um, one of the main reasons for the crash is that um, investors, they tend to group investments and they put these investments, the crypto investments into the risk bucket. But also in the risk bucket are things like Tesla and Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, and what we've seen is that with fears of inflation, the investors have pulled out of the risk bucket. And that's why we've also seen these largest companies in the world take huge nosedives. Um, and crypto has also follow, followed suit. So it isn't something specific to crypto. However, what crypto has going for it is that it's very early in its adoption stage. So while these others, while these other stocks, they're also early, early in their adoption stage, but they're 20, 30 years, the internet's been around for a while now. Um, what we'll see is that uh, crypto is so early in its adoption stage that it'll benefit from more and more people adopting it. And so while people are pulling out of the risk bucket, there's a counterweight of the greater adoption. And um, what we've seen with technology in general is that the pace of adoption has grown. It took something like 50 years for refrigerators to go from 0% to be 100% of households, almost 100%. Um, however, with the internet, it took a much shorter time. And with each new technology, it takes shorter and shorter times. And right now, we see crypto has a pace of adoption of about 100% increase. So that means double sure. every year. Yeah. And at this rate, we're looking at between 2024, and 2025, a billion people using crypto. If that rate continues, it may not, but if it does. Um, and so as these people come in, they're likely to buy Bitcoin and Ether. These are the blue chips of the space, amongst other things as well. And as they buy this, it's likely that we'll see these prices go up. Speaking to that, there's thousands of different cryptocurrencies out there. How, how do investors know which ones are the best to invest in? Yeah, well, when it comes to, um, I'm going to use the internet analogy again. If you were in the 90s and you really believed in this thing called the internet, it's difficult to pick Amazon and pick Google instead of picking Yahoo and MySpace, etc. Um, so what approach could one take? Well, I suppose one approach is to do a lot of research and try and make it your day job and pick. Uh, and you could still be wrong. Um, a lot of professional investors were. However, another approach is to actually take an approach where you try and take a broad exposure to the market. So you say, I'm going to buy the top 10 internet companies. And what I'll do is that as a company starts to lose market share, lose share value, I'll sell. And as a new company starts to gain market share, I'll buy. What this means is that you won't get Amazon when it was at $1. But however, you'll still get to enjoy most of its growth. Because once it breaks into that top market share, it still has a lot of growth to go. And this way, you don't need to be a genius and actually pick the right ones. You can just take broad exposure to the space. And not to punt my own product, but that's why we have a basket to actually provide broad exposure to the space because it's really hard to pick, even for someone like me, and this is my day job. Of course, yeah, just make life easy for retail investors. Exactly. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Gaurav. Fascinating conversation. I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Ross. It was such a pleasure.